side too. Yeah, we will. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your thanks for your patience. Uh, can everybody hear me okay with my mask on and everything? I just uh, it's been a long 36 hours or so. Uh, I wanted to. We've been having a lot of uh, inquiries from different news outlets, and obviously the community wants an update on uh, the status of our investigation, uh, uh, the status of. Uh, uh, our officer that's in the hospital, uh, obviously how the family's doing and how the department's doing. And we're going to go over all those issues. I'll go through my speaking points and I will open it up uh, to questions. First and foremost, I want to tell this community thank you from the bottom of our hearts. The outpouring of, <clears throat> of love and support uh, from around the city of Houston, the state of Texas, and around the country has uh, really been beyond touching. Uh, the prayers, the thoughts, and and uh, and I think the recognition that uh, Sergeant uh, Preston's life mattered to everything that we do, mattered to what this nation, what this city, what this state should be all about, and that's about police officers doing a great job, and when police officers make the ultimate sacrifice, like Harold did, like Sergeant Preston did, that we need to recognize that and that in a, in a nation where we're talking a lot about uh, police reform and accountability and we want to hold those officers that uh, fall short or, or dishonor the badge accountable, we also want to work just as hard to recognize and lift up the good officers. And uh, we've all been spending a lot of time with our officers <clears throat> in the last uh, we always spend a lot of time with our officers, but in the last 36 hours, and I can tell you that uh, in, in tragedy, there's always silver linings. And one of the silver linings in this tragedy is for this community, once again, to show the men and women of the Houston Police Department just how much they truly are appreciated, uh, that to, to, for their officers to be able to see just how much this the community appreciates the good work that goes on here. And they hold us accountable like they should when we don't do something right and correctly, but that, that, that our community supports us. Uh, so let's go over what we have. Uh, our special investigations detectives that I think are just absolutely phenomenal have worked around the clock uh, on this case. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Chief uh, Heather Morris and uh, her, com and her uh, team, uh, Commander Knoll, and uh, everyone at SIU uh, and our partners for the work they've been doing. They have literally been working nonstop without sleeping to ensure that we bring justice to Harold Preston, our fallen hero, and to Courtney Waller, our uh, wounded hero there that's in the hospital, and to uh, our suspect's 14-year-old uh, son who was not only shot by his own father, but was obviously in a home uh, where domestic violence was occurring. And I'm very grateful that our victim services unit has worked very closely with our partners to uh, provide uh, safety for, for that woman, that mother, that son that had been victimized by this father. And, uh, and I'm grateful that they're okay and that the Houston Police Department was able to be there and that Sergeant Preston gave his life so they wouldn't give their life because we know what happens all too often in these domestic violence situations when a woman has said enough and that abusive husband ends up committing a murder and we're just grateful that this sacrifice is not in vain and that that family is going to be safe. <clears throat> uh, after again they've been working for around the clock and this afternoon the district attorney's office, uh, DA and her team uh, have filed charges uh, against uh, Elmer Rolando Manzano, 51 years of age. The charges are that have been filed in the 339th district, State District Court include capital murder for the murder of Sergeant Harold Preston, 
attempted capital murder, for the attempted capital murder of Houston police officer Courtney Waller, and aggravated assault, serious body injury uh, for the shooting uh, of the 14-year-old of the son. Officer Waller, I'm happy to report, and the young man, the 14-year-old son, remained in the hospital in stable condition. Uh, last night, uh, Chief Bainbridge and I were able to visit with him. You can imagine that his heart, his heart is heavy uh, because he lost his sergeant, and not to mention he almost lost his own life. But he is surrounded by families, and uh, he is in the best care, I think, arguably it's one of the best medical facilities in the, in the country, as is the 14-year-old young man. He will have to uh, undergo additional surgery tomorrow and possibly another one after that. The suspect uh, who's in custody condition, but he is in our custody. We are watching him 24-7, is in stable condition with a gunshot wound to the abdomen, and uh, that gunshot wound uh, is as a result of uh, uh, what appears from a return fire from Sergeant Preston that potentially saved the life of his fellow officers in that family. Sergeant Preston suffered multiple gunshot wounds and was again transported to Memorial Hermann Texas Medical Center where he was pronounced deceased. Sergeant Preston was assigned to Southwest Patrol Division and was sworn in as an officer in August, in August 1979, serving this city for 41 years. He was about two weeks away from finally retiring, had bought himself a motorcycle to actually enjoy in retirement, and I can just say as everyone up here were people of faith, we believe that he's uh, riding motorcycle now in heaven with the, on the wings of angels. Officer, Officer Waller suffered a serious against gunshot wound to the arm. We asked the community for continued prayer for Officer Waller and his family, for Officer Preston and his family, and just to recap what happened. Uh, the incident began when Officer Waller and another officer responded to a disturbance call in an apartment complex at 2626 Holly Hall and met, and, and met with the female and her teenage son outside the complex. The female requested officers' assistance regarding a disturbance with her husband, Manzano. Officer Waller and the second officer then requested assistance from a supervisor for some guidance, and we know that uh, Sergeant Preston was that front line leading from the front man who responded. After Sergeant Preston spoke with the female, he, Officer Wall, and the second officer walked to the apartment to make contact with Manzano. When Manzano did not and would not answer the door, his son used a key to enter the apartment, or to open the door. As soon as the door opened, Manzano was standing on the other side of the door with a semi-automatic pistol in his hand pointed toward his son and Officer Waller. As I said yesterday, the son immediately said he's got a gun, and Officer Waller immediately started trying to back up, uh, trying to go for his pistol, and the suspect immediately opened fire. He fired several shots at his son, in the directions of his son, and uh, an officer standing in the doorway, uh, striking, again, three victims. Sergeant Preston managed to return fire one time and struck Mazzano, who then barricaded himself in the apartment. Uh, our SWAT team and hostage negotiation teams responded to the scene and Manzano surrendered a short time later after having again being shot uh, in, the, in, in the abdomen, in the stomach area. As is customary, this incident is being investigated by HPD Special Investigations Unit, the Internal Affairs Division, and the Harris County District Attorney's Office with the assistance, obviously, of the Houston Forensic Science Center and the medical examiners. Uh, before I take questions, I want to again thank the Houston Fire Department, who we know uh, with the death of Investigator Bruce, uh, you know, they show again what public safety and public servants and first responders are all about. We don't get to just shut down the department when we lose uh, uh, one of our own. They're mourning themselves the death of Investigator Bruce. It happened Thursday and the Friday morning. 
And just a few days later, there they were with us, uh, valiantly, valiantly trying to save the life of uh, Sergeant Preston, uh, Officer Waller, and the 14-year-old young man, and they uh, succeeded uh, in two of those cases. I also want to thank again uh, Memorial Herman. They are just phenomenal. We always like to say that if you can't be saved at Herman or Ben Taub or any of our big trauma centers here in Houston or the envy of the world, you can't be saved. Uh, and then I want to just say the la one last thing to the young man. We've seen all the videos that placed himself at risk, the, the, the former gang member. Uh, that's a, a silver lining we've been talking about with our officers. It shows that people that make bad choices can redeem themselves, that redemption is possible, and it shows what makes this city so, so, so very special. Uh, when, our, when, when the going gets tough in Houston, we come together. I also want to thank uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, the United States Department of Justice. Uh, they've been working very closely with us uh, since the onset of this case. Uh, it, everyone knows it's this, uh, this suspect is a, a foreign national, Salvadorian, who uh, his immigration status is undocumented. And I want to thank uh, ICE. The FBI, who have all come together, like we always do, uh, coalescing around each other to ensure that any appropriate federal charges are also pursued. Uh, and I'm sure that in, by tomorrow you will hear uh, of federal charges being uh, led <coughs> against this, uh, this suspect. And, and that's, again, important to us because when someone takes a life, tries to take the life of their own son, as far as I'm concerned, and someone is just purely evil, and when all the facts come out in this case that we're not going to discuss today, this is a purely, pure, a very evil person, uh, we need to make sure that we pursue every avenue of justice to bring justice and closure to the Preston family and to everyone involved. And so with that, I want to thank all of our partners, including the District Attorney's Office, Houston Forensic Science Center, medical examiners, and everyone that came out, including our partners with the fire department in, in Harris County, and everyone that has uh, been really facing our department. Now, we'll open up the questions, but I would be remiss if I didn't thank the leadership cadre you see up here, including Commander Halliday, who's only been a commander for how long now? Five months. Five months, and he's dealing with, uh, quite frankly, the most difficult set of circumstances that uh, to deal with, and that's a, to take you note know, of not just a, a, a great cop, but a great man. I'm telling you, I'm so proud of you. Very proud of you. Very proud of your officers. And very proud of this command staff. <clears throat> We've come together. This is not our first rodeo. And it's sad to say, and suffice to say, it will not be our, our last rodeo. That's just the world we live in. And the fact that our officers know that at any given call, they are always at a disadvantage because we don't just get to, in this nation, walk around with our guns out everywhere we want to go and just prone everybody out. We have to always respond to the actions of the suspect. We know that action beats reaction and that our officers, because of the rules of engagement that rightfully we have to follow in a democracy and the nation of law where the rule of law matters, uh, they know the risk they take. And, and I would just ask people to just pause and, again, continue to pray for all of our involved personnel. And the family that called us there, because that's a decent family. It's a decent woman that has been victimized. And you can imagine uh, the guilt that she's going through with her own son almost getting killed and a police officer getting killed and another police officer almost killed. But her nightmare is over, and I want her to know, and all victims of domestic violence to know, that this department is here for you. Our partners in the private sector are here for you. The Houston Area Women's Center is here for you. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you're black or white, Hispanic, Asian, 
It doesn't matter what part of town you're from, and it doesn't matter whether you're documented or undocumented, because our investigations, uh, our investigators, investigations revealing <clears throat> that this family was held hostage by this man, in part because of the mom's immigration status. And I'm glad that she, because I, in part because of all the work we do to do community outreach, constant outreach to our immigrant community, that she finally had the courage to, 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 to stand up for herself and her son, and she will never have to face this monster again. So with that, I'll open up the questions. I want to thank you all for your patience today, and, uh, and let's, just, uh, let's just get ready to celebrate the life of Investigator Bruce tomorrow. We should have more details about funeral arrangements for Sergeant Preston. Uh, as soon as this is over, I'm actually going to go visit. We're going to go visit with the family. Uh, and, it, and, and, and we gather our strength from the Preston family, especially Mama. Mama's 84 years old, and that woman is, she's a, she's a rock. And they say that the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, and it didn't. Again, so I'll open up the questions. Chief uh, Dr. Thompson with HMD Magazine. Uh, first, my condolences to you and the entire police family. You are all in our prayers. Um, I know what it takes for police not to be in certain communities. When they said uh, that and before that, get away the police, and was one of the first who said, no, let's reform and let's make it better. So I feel very bad. We also cried alongside and thank you. we want to first thank you for everything that you do. Before I ask my questions, I want um, the case is a little bit complicated. Immigration complicates it. Uh, the proud uh, criminal history and background of the accused complicates it. There is also this election year where the district attorney is contesting with an opponent who is pointing fingers at her and saying that she actually handed the gun to the accused and let him kill our police officer because he, uh, the DA's office knew that there was this uh, number of calls and reports about this person and they don't know why with a terroristic threat they are not taking him out of the apartment or from the community and that would have saved, you know, an officer and getting the gun out of his hands. So at this stage, the community may want to know who actually makes the definitive decision as to if an accused is arrested. Is it okay. the police witness? Yeah, let, 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 yeah. Is it the police witness or is it the DA's office? And then the follow-up to that is at the point where uh, officers were getting to the door and they knew that this person knew that they had been called and he would not have opened the door. <coughs> Didn't they look at that as a high risk situation, not to even follow the son, go in there, open the door and expose themselves to all of uh, to what has happened. Those are that's the follow up question. Okay, let me just uh, first uh, thank you for the question. The question is about uh, whether or not the firearm that was used to uh, to uh, kill our officer and attempt to kill another officer and, and, and commit an aggravated assault uh, was the result of the DA giving that gun back. That is not accurate, that is not true. Uh, our officers, if they would have found him in possession of a firearm, uh, he's a felon in possession and he's in possession of a firearm, I, we don't have any information that ever happened. I can just tell you that based on what I've seen so far in our review, uh, we did our best to deal with what we knew at the time, and so did the DA's office. The DA's office is ultimately the one that takes, accepts charges, and we didn't have enough for them to accept charges. In terms of the terroristic threat, uh, yesterday when this tragedy occurred, we were, our, part of our plan was to try to get terroristic threat uh, charges, and we know what happened. We never got to that point because we ended up having this man come out and start shooting. In terms of whether the son should have opened the door or not, that's a, that's a matter that will be part of our investigation to see from a tactical standpoint, a, a tactical perspective, if that would have been the best approach. But right now, let's just be real clear, there's only one person responsible for the death of a police officer, 
for the attempted murder, capital murder, of another police officer, for the aggravated of assault of a young 14-year-old son, and that person, in case you don't know, is Manzano, Soli Manzano, Elmer Rolando Manzano, 51 years of age, is solely the person responsible for a capital murder of a police officer, the attempt at capital murder of another police officer, and the aggravated assault of this one, and that's going to be our focus. There's plenty of time for all that other nonsense. We're not interested in that. I can tell you that, you know, when we work with the DA's office, we agree more often than not, and sometimes the different perspective, that has nothing to do with this here. Everyone had information. They acted in the, in, 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 with, their, with the best of their ability, uh, and our focus is going to be on one person and one person only, and that's Elmer Rolando Manzano, 51 years of age, who we are looking forward to taking uh, to justice through the criminal justice system. Chief, got questions else? from the pool, the pool cameras tonight. Uh, when a criminal background check. Who's it from? Run, uh, KPRC, but it's also from the pool, so from all the stations okay. that have us here. Uh, when the criminal background check was run, did it show Manzano's immigration status at all? I don't. I don't the department stands on not asking an individual okay first of all that is absolutely not true okay i know that reporters only like to listen and hear to what they like to hear there is no prohibition against ha asking someone for their immigration status there's a prohibition for acting asking someone about their immigration status if you don't have an investigative need and let me give you an example if you go in pursuit of a van and at the end of the pursuit, 20 people go out running from that van. That's an indication of potential human trafficking. That's a set of circumstances where we will ask immigration status. And, a, and if you don't, I will not be happy with you because that is an element of the offense that we are investigating. But if you stop someone for a taillight out, and you have no other information for we don't expect you to be asking about immigration status. We're not the immigration police. One. Two, let's be real clear. This is the state of Texas. Well, there is no sanctuary here for anyone who's hurting people. We come after people really hard. So I'm not sure where they got that. When they show me the policy that says we can't ask, let me know because we'd be in violation of state law. We are certified by the federal government uh, for not being a sanctuary city because that would actually be a sanctuary city if you completely ignored it. Not to mention that historically this department before when we had jails, we, they actually for many years would honor ICE detainers contrary to what other places do. What else? Chief, uh, I, I, first off my condolences to you, you and the fellow command staff for this. Um, I, what became of the report that was filed uh, by Mr. Manzano's ex-wife at the Southwest Station on Saturday, and what, what did she report? Uh, you know what? That, I don't have that information uh, here right now. Uh, uh, I, I don't have it with me. Again, our focus right now is on capital murder. Our focus right now is attempted capital murder. That is the primary focus is looking at getting this man charged. Now, our second part of what we always do is that we will always review the entire sequence of events to look for any lessons learned, any mistakes made, anything that we didn't do, to look for the good, the bad, and the ugly. But our number one focus right now is the capital murder investigation. All that sequence of events is going to be important for us from a learning perspective and even from an accountability perspective if we had to go down to that route. But we're, but today my focus is on the, on the capital murder. Uh, but, we'll, we'll, but that will be part of our, including our tacticals. We will look at the tactics. We'll look at everything. We, that's why we have patrol tactics unit come to every one of our critical incidents to look at what we did to see if there's a, a to see if, number one, we're following our training, number two, if our training is, is sufficient, number three, if we need to change anything in training. And, you know, that will come out in due time. But my focus right now, number one priority, is to hold Manzano accountable for capital murder.
Okay, what else? Just to clarify, you did mention briefly that you of the the state fire where the officer did show up department and the DA, to the best of your knowledge, you guys were in agreement there was no probable cause to charge anyone I, at that time. So that seems to be a you know what? Again, everybody's lot. trying to do this yeah. uh, and, and trying to pit the DA's office against us. We're not going down, down that road. I believe in uh, on the, what I've seen so far is that our officers acted in good faith based with the information they had. The DA's office uh, acted in good faith with the information they had. And right now our focus is going to be on a capital murder charge on this guy. Uh, but but again, uh, if, you know, if we found something later, we, we would, on either side, we always work very closely with the DA's office, and uh, most of the time we agree, and sometimes we agree to disagree, but this case, I, I believe that everybody acted in, in, in good faith. And the DA's office says the death penalty is under consideration. How do you feel about that? Uh, you know what? I, 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 do you really need to ask that question? I, you know, I, I'm, I, the, the, the Old Testament did have some things that I agreed with, and when you... And when the facts come out in this case, this is to me something that uh, I would not have uh, any hesitation to say I support the death penalty in this case. This is not going to be a case of circumstantial evidence. This is not going to be a case where uh, there's any chance whatsoever that we're sending somebody to death that didn't, that did not commit a crime. We will be able to, we will be able to prove without an ounce of I mean, without an iota of doubt, who killed this man. In some other cases where, you know, that maybe aren't quite as strong, I may have a different feeling. But in this case, there is absolutely no chance that, of a wrongful conviction. So I would not have a, I would, I would be just fine with the death penalty. Chief, a follow-up to the previous question as far as immigration status. Do we think there should be a change in law in light of Sergeant Preston's murder and what all happened here? No, I mean, what, 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 I, I, what, what law do you want to change? I'm not sure what law. We just have to enforce the laws that are on the books now. And, you know, everything's about resources for both the federal government and for us. Uh, we focus again on going after crooks, not cooks, right? So we go out, we come, you know, uh, after anybody is committing criminal offenses, we come now. If you want us to go do day laborers, that's sorry, I don't. I don't have enough officers. We have the same number of officers today that we had 20 years ago, and we've grown by 500,000 people. I don't have the bandwidth to start doing day laborers. Just don't. So if there's any changes for law, it's a matter for the legislature to figure out, but I think it's all about resources and priorities. So for me, if I had a choice between trying to get a, a, a guy that's a violent criminal one of the things that I can tell you as police chiefs across the country that we've always said that we should focus our limited resources on going against, first and foremost, against dangerous criminals for, for, for immigration status as opposed to a person working in a factory that but for their immigration status don't harm anybody because we do have limited resources and so does the federal government. We understand and, that Officer Waller was the, speaking with the DA's office on Tuesday before the shooting happened. What it, apparently it was about an incident on Monday he was discussing. What happened on Monday that prompted that? I don't. I, I don't. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I'm not like I just told you guys. That's secondary. We're not focusing on that. What happened on Monday had nothing to do with the man. Multiple times, killing a cop. Almost killing another cop almost killing his own son, I, I'm focusing on what we need to focus on, not distractions, not noise. There's not. I'm not going there. What else? Chief, could we get it in Spanish, a recap? Or tell them to go to Again, let's do it in Spanish now. That's what I love to hear you say about the Midtown incident. Overnight, I didn't know. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll, let's do that separate. Okay. Chief, before you get to Telemundo. No, 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 no. We're going to do Telemundo okay. first. Okay. Let's, be, let's be courteous now. Okay. Because then I'll forget. Okay, you want to do finish with English? No, 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 no. We got to make you wait. Can't uh, make my, my, my hint there waiting there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got to take care of the people, everybody. We are equal opportunity yes. department. And I, I get bilingual pay, so if I don't use it, I'll get in trouble. You know what I'm saying? That $60 is a lot of money. All right.
Bueno, buenas tardes. Esta tarde, eh, para empezar, quiero decirle a la comunidad que nos da darles las gracias por todas las oraciones, por todo el apoyo, por todos los mensajes que lo han dado nuestros oficiales. Nos está dando fuerza en esta, en esta temporada de tanto tragedia con, nuestro, con el, 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 el homicidio del sargento Preston. Estoy bien orgulloso de los esfuerzos de nuestros colegas aquí del Departamento de Policía de Houston. Han trabajado 24 horas, 24 horas sin parar trabajando. Y hoy queremos anunciar que tenemos cargas contra el sospechoso Elmer Rolando Manzano, de 51 años, eh, salvadoreño, que tiene una carga de uh, homicidio otra carga de, eh, de atentado de homicidio y asalto agravado con, eh, 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 con, con uh, uh, en la corte de, tre, de 339 eh, eh, corte estatal. Estamos eh, muy agradecidos de los esfuerzos eh, de Panta de Bomberos de Houston, de eh, el hospital en uh, uh, Herman Memorial y en todas las personas que hicieron todo lo que pusieron para salvar la vida del sargento Preston. La comunidad inmigratoria, uh, no tenga temor si eres víctima, no tengas temor de llamar a la policía de Houston, porque aquí estamos para las víctimas del crimen. No se dejen que se esté abusando de un hombre abusador o de cualquier otro criminal porque aquí estamos para la justicia eh, y, vamos a, y vamos a llevar a los sospechosos a cuenta. También quiero darle las uh, gracias a nuestros colegas al nivel federal, al fiscal federal, al Departamento de Justicia, al FBI, al ATF y a Homeland Security por su asistencia, que están también, van a buscar cargas federales contra el sospechoso, porque al fin del día una persona que mata a un oficial Ma, trata de matar a otro oficial y por poco mata a su propio hijo y abusa de su mujer es un hombre que tenemos que llevarlo a cuenta y tenemos que buscar justicia por nuestras víctimas así que gracias de nuevo la, la investigación va a continuar ok, anything else I, I, did I hear you correctly earlier when you said you, you didn't have evidence that he had a gun did Mr. Mazzano have a weapon I don't, I don't, I, no, I said that I, to my knowledge, he didn't have a, a firearm in his, in his possession on his person when we contacted him. But again, everybody wants to focus on that. We're focusing on first degree murder. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we're going to ignore if we had any missteps or some, any opportunity that we missed. We're not going to, we're not going to run from that. Was that but that, oppor but, but let's be real clear. He pulled the trigger and that's what we're focusing on. So I'm not aware of any uh, of us finding him with a firearm on his, on his person. I'm not, I'm not aware of any. Let's be clear. He's not talking about yesterday. Right. No, he's talking about the, he's talking about the previous incident. That's not what he said, so I want to make sure that we're very clear. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Yes, Chief. Uh, you talked about uh, the Homeland Security involved and all these other agencies which are related to immigration. Uh, this lady you said was undocumented, and according to the law, if she's been abused repeatedly, she's uh, right to have asylum, even though President Trump is against this. Based on his own immigration ideas and uh, philosophy, that talks about a typical case like this, where, it's, in quote, illegal immigrants pour into our country, into America, kill Americans, do whatever and nobody's trying to help. And from where you're coming from, your explanation, your leadership within the Association of Chiefs and uh, other works that you've been doing. I know there are people out there in the community who are now scared, who may be afraid, who may not know what's going on, who may want to go and hide. What do you have to say to them? What advice are you going to say to them from your leadership experience, it's the same advice we always give. You know, it, whether it's the last administration or this administration, the facts, regardless of the political theater that politicians on both sides like to engage in, 
the there's still systems and processes in the law, including today, that if you're a victim of a crime or a witness to a crime, uh, uh, that we can actually get together with a victim services unit and you will get uh, and we'll work in getting your U visa or not or the appropriate visa to keep you in the country legally. It has not gone away. It is still here. Uh, we actually have our victim services unit working very closely with this uh, victim. She is a victim and she's a very key witness and her son will be a key witness in the capital murder case of a police officer and the capital murder case of another police officer. And so I have every uh, confidence that the uh, Department of Homeland Security will work very closely with us like they always do to ensure that they can actually stay in the country and they can actually they'll be able to get uh, be able to vote and not vote excuse me <laughs> erase that immediately okay uh, but we'll be able to actually work uh, once you get the U visa you'll actually be able to, to work uh, which is important because you have to make a living and you have to feed your family you have to food, feed your 14 year old uh, so uh, we, uh, we we want the community to know like we always say the only ones that need to fear the Houston Police Department or any other state or local police department are violent criminals and people are either hurting other people, committing violent crimes, stealing, uh, or committing those kind of crimes. We, we, that's, that's what we focus on is, is people uh, committing crimes of the penal code, the safety code, the codes across the country that we're tasked with enforcing. And again, I want to thank our Victim Services Unit, one of our priorities when, I, when Mayor Turner brought me here in 2016, the, uh, November 30th, 2016, was to increase our number of victim services uh, counselors and in part with some of the grant we've gotten from our federal partners, we've been able to increase that unit. I think they're doing great work. So don't fear it. We're here for you. And in fact, when you are a victim, you step forward, you get you end up getting protections that you would not have otherwise. All right, thank you, everybody. Oh, yeah. But you don't mind just standing there. No, go ahead. Because I, because I gotta get going. I've yeah. gotta get to the family. They're expecting me in 30 what minutes. Were you, what were you? Uh, three people killed last night. It looks like the fire chief said the bar probably shouldn't have been open. I mean, I know you guys aren't enforcement of bars. Um, how does what happened last night sort of kind of dovetail into the uh, There was some kind of disturbance and uh, some fools started shooting. You know, we have uh, the gun violence right now across the nation is uh, increasing uh, for a myriad of reasons, but I am confident we're going to catch these, mm -hmm. these individuals. And when we catch them, we're going we're gonna to take them to the jail, we're going to book them, and then we're going to see what the judges do and the magistrates do. Because I think you know that part of the problem is that criminal justice reform is running amok a little bit, where we're... We're treating violent criminals with not just a history of convictions for violence, but being booked for violence are not being held. And that's a problem. Our cops are doing their job. We're, we're going after the same violent criminals time and again because they're going in one door and out the other. That's a problem. But that's going to be a problem for the people of Harris County to pay attention to. And I'm telling you that the majority of that problem does not lie. It doesn't lie in the DA's office. It lies right there in that courthouse with magistrates and some of these criminal court judges. And they're mistaken if they think that people of color, communities of color, that are disproportionately are impacted. We're out there a lot. Those judges don't go out there like we do. We, we have people come up to us all the time from the black community, from the Hispanic community, from the poor community, thanking us for speaking out. And every single person, every single community will have a breaking point. There will be a backlash if they continue with that mindset that you can have six bonds, commit murder, and go hurt other people. Or that you can be a felon and we catch you with guns and there are no consequences. There's no parole violations, no probation violations. There will be a backlash. This again, not our first rodeo. We've seen this before where the pendulum goes this way, now it's gone this way, and if they're not careful, legitimate criminal justice reform we should be focused on is going to go by the wayside. Criminal justice reform is about why are we booking people that have a one rock and treating them like they're an Al Capone 
That's a person that needs treatment, not going to prison. Let's take that rock and let's get them some treatment. There's a lot of really legitimate criminal justice reform we need to be focusing on. And coddling violent criminals ain't criminal justice reform. It is reckless and it's resulting in a lot of innocent people being killed in the city. And it's not just here. It's in Philadelphia. It's in Los Angeles. It's in Seattle. It's in uh, New York City. It is something we just finished. And I'm going to say this is the president of the major city chiefs talking about that we, we have to deal with the appropriateness of some of this criminal justice reform across the nation, not just here in Harris County. Okay, thank you all. But we're going to catch those guys. Yeah, please. Yeah. Did you hear that? Uh, please try to give them a little space, the Preston, uh, the family. Uh, both, both families. Thank you all. All right. Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo wrapping up a news conference there talking about uh, the shooting of two police officers as well as a 14-year-old boy that happened yesterday. Uh, we'll recap now what was discussed by the police chief there here in just one second. Once again, I'm Will Dupree here in the KXA and live studio. Thank you all for sticking around with our stream. If you missed anything the chief said, I'm going to recount that, so uh, just bear with me. Bear with me one second. Uh, the chief announced that the shooter is now facing three charges. Those include capital murder, attempted capital murder, and aggravated assault causing seriously serious bodily injury. And that is for the death of Sergeant Harold Preston, the injury of Officer Courtney Waller, and injury to the suspect's own 14-year-old son. The police chief is saying that funeral arrangements should be announced as early as tomorrow for Sergeant Preston. Um, he's going to meet with the family right now to talk about that. Additionally, the police chief says that Officer Waller is in the hospital still. He is likely to have surgery tomorrow on his arm after he was shot there, and he may need additional surgeries after that. The 14-year-old son of the suspect remains in the hospital as well after he was also shot. He is listed in stable condition, so that means he is likely to fully recover from those injuries. We also want to point out that the police chief said that Sergeant Preston, who had been with the department for 41 years, was just two weeks away from retirement and had bought a motorcycle to spend some of his time um, away from the job. And unfortunately, his family is now planning his funeral and mourning the loss of him. Um, and from the sound of what the police chief was describing him as he was a uh, beloved man there in the department and in the community. And so we, of course, send our thoughts to his family and his coworkers and loved ones um, after this really tragic shooting. We will have more information about this over on our website. You can find it there, kxan.com, and on the KXAN News app on your smartphone. Thanks again, everybody, for watching as long as you have. I'm Will Dupree with the KXAN Live Center. Thanks so much for watching again. We'll see you back here another time. Please, everyone, stay safe and stay healthy.